Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members and Participants, we are now live. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, our meeting uh, for the Committee on Children and Youth uh, today. Law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the uh, current public health emergency, City Council committee committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer testimony at public hearings of council uh, committees are included in a public hearing notice uh, that are published in the Daily News, the Enquirer, and the Legal Intelligence prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now note that the hour has come. Uh, Mr. Spivey, will you please call, I'm sorry, Mr. Spivey, well, would you please call um, the roll to take attendance? Members uh, that are in attendance will indicate that you are present when your name is called. Also, uh, please say a few brief remarks when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen. Thank you, uh, Council Member Brooks. I believe we have Councilmember Brooks, but maybe muted. Uh, Councilmember Gautier. Good, um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and colleagues, and to all of the panelists present. Councilmember Johnson. Uh, Councilmember Gem. I am present. And Acting Chair uh, Thomas. I'm present. Um, thank you. A uh, quorum of the committee is present and this hearing is now called to order. Uh, this is a public hearing of the Committee of Children and Youth regarding resolution number 210757. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Clerk, will you please read the title of the resolution? Resolution 210757. Authorizing City Council's Committee on Children and Youth to hold hearings examining out of school time programs and funding from the 2021 summer targeted at improving safety and positive life outcomes for Philadelphia's young people. Thank you. Uh, before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses we have today, everyone who's been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that the public hearing is now uh, being recorded. Uh, because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note that for the record that at this time that we will use the chat feature available on Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized in order to comply with the Sunshine Act. The chat feature must only be used uh, for this purposes. Uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, will you please call the first panel we have here to testify this afternoon on resolution number 210757. Yes, for the first panel we have. I'm sorry, Mr. Clerk, before that panel goes, I just want to acknowledge that Council Member uh, Kendra Brook is president. Sorry, Mr. Clerk, you may proceed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the first panel, we have Cynthia F Figueroa. Uh, Deputy Mayor, Office of Children and Families, and Catherine Ott Lovell, Commissioner of Parks and Rec. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, please say your name for the record and you may begin with your testimony. Good afternoon. Um, happy to be here. I'm going to actually ask, I have just some slides to walk through through my testimony, so just bear with me for a second while we get that PowerPoint up on the shared screen. Good afternoon, I'm Cynthia Figueroa, Deputy Mayor, Office of Children and Families. Thank you, Chairperson Helen Gim. I hope you feel better. And of course, our um, Acting Chairperson, Councilman Thomas, and members of the Committee on Children and Youth for the opportunity to present today. I'm joined as reference um, by Commissioner of Parks and Recreation, Catherine Ott Lavelle, as well as I have other members of my team in order to answer questions. And I'm pleased to provide an overview of our most recent summer 2021, as well as talking about our academic uh, year programming currently underway. Go to the next slide. Uh, just as a quick overview, the Office of Children and Family aligns to work and to serve in very specific four goals. 
We work with OST to meet each one of these goals, from supporting children's safety to youth employment. OST programs are critical. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Following a year of virtual summer, I'm very excited to say that we were able to embrace summer, not entirely knowing what we were going to expect after almost a full year of virtual learning. We went in with a lot of excitement and um, a huge thank you to you, Councilmember Thomas, um, as well as um, all the members of the committee who were really clear that we wanted to make sure that we had safe and active places for young people to be involved over the course of the summer. And go to the next slide. So we had the quick ability to deploy summer programs and it was aided by our experience in running access centers. The access centers helped provide a roadmap to demonstrate that we could do all day in programming and we could do it during a pandemic and in a way to keep children safe. I'm pleased to say that our summer and fall programs were robust Although I will say the pandemic did have impacts in terms of getting folks comfortable or feeling safe enough to engage in all the different activities that were available. We had programs that ranged from math and reading supports to chess, coding, dance, sports, STEM, and a number of creative arts. And this was significant to have as many of these kind of activities post uh, a, virtual, uh, a virtual year for our children. Our large network of OST providers reflected in our OST investment were grounded in decades of research that show the more engaged youth are in their schools and more they're engaged with um, programs and activities in their communities, the more successful they are and less likely to be involved in violent activity. We're gonna go to the next slide. Just a few months ago, we concluded this summer. Uh, it's hard to believe, things seem to be going really fast. We had over 309 summer camps and we tracked 7, 7, 75,000 reading minutes. There was a number of literacy and math programs infused throughout all of our programs. And I think you all know that this was an unprecedented summer for us with the school district. In addition to the programs that were running um, on a traditional schedule, we also had been able to encourage and not have um, play streets throughout hundreds of blocks. And we targeted very specific neighborhoods to ensure that the play streets were available in these communities. And we were so excited. I know Catherine's on with me that Camp Philly in the Poconos was able to be back and in person. And we had 122 participants uh, this year. Next slide. Um, sorry, I'm in my head. We were we kept focused on our academic year, and I, one of the things I just wanted to share is that our out of school time work is part of an of our portfolio in children and families. And so, OST is a preventive service model, and we have through our programming, and you'll see it in, in the next slide that there's community access. So there's programs that assist in keeping kids engaged and supervised. And then there are more tailored programs that we operate with systems partners throughout the city. And most of those are tailored to older youth and teens to obviously in their developmental stages of life, particularly focused on um, kids who have risky behaviors or low school attendance. But we also have been focusing obviously on work exposure and work experience. Next slide. So this gives you just a quick snapshot. This is not all the programs in the Office of Children and Families, but these are the programs that fall into what we would reflect as our OST services. So I mentioned um, some of these already in terms of what was available this summer, but Parks and Rec has a whole list, as you can see here, of programs that operate. And then our prevention services, which is what's been traditionally been dubbed our out of school time, as well as broken up from elementary, middle and high school. And then, uh, of course, our work ready supports that we do in partnership with Philadelphia Youth Network, who I believe you'll hear from later today. And then we were able to run and are running currently now our LEAP program through the free library. We go to the next slide. So again, just a snapshot in terms of the investments uh, out of school time, both summer and um, school year. They're for over, just over 14,000 slots. And then in Parks and Rec, both after school and summer slots, we have about five, just over 5,000 participants. 
For the free library after school, uh, about a thousand slots um, that we have available and then work ready. Our goal is always to be closer to the 8,000. 5,000 of those slots are funded specifically by OCF and the funding that comes directly from the city of Philadelphia. Next slide. So I just wanted to share that one of the great pieces of feedback that you all gave to us and that we've continued to use is making sure that folks know where to locate programs that are within their zip codes. Um, and we did a lot of mapping as well as where programs uh, need to belong. So we have the phila.gov uh, forward slash OST where you can put in and find information about programming. It, the locator has a lot of different ways you can look for programs in there. And we are continue to advertise and make sure that folks know where to find uh, programs in their area. And I think, so lastly, I just wanna say a huge thank you, um, particularly uh, Council Member Gim and Council Member Thomas were instrumental in connecting us to programs in addition to our traditional OST providers. This past summer, we were able to engage a number of additional community partners to bring them to the table to make sure that we could expand services for kids this summer. It's pretty unprecedented. It's hard to, to remember that we were um, planning for summer and now we're already about to celebrate the holidays again and that we'll be thinking about next summer. <laughs> soon enough. So uh, we can stop sharing and um, Catherine, myself, or anybody, members of my team are happy to answer questions that you have about this last summer or where we're going into in terms of um, this fall, this winter and coming spring. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, for your testimony. And also, um, not sure if it's appropriate or not, but this might be one of our last hearings together. Uh, so I do appreciate um, the work that you have done, um, not just um, during my short term in council, but in general, your service to the city of Philadelphia and the heart that you have as it relates to children and families across the city. Um, I did want to start with just a few questions and then I wanted to open it up to my colleagues for a few questions as well. Um, if we can go back to the slide that had the number of um, total children that we serve, you broke it down uh, by young people who are involved in PYN, young people who are involved in, um, yep, there it is. You just passed so the, the next the next slide to have yes that so these are right so these are availability of slots um right. and right so this shows you the year round numbers um and some of them are um you know very we can drill down specifically so our numbers um suggest that we have um close to a hundred thousand young people living in poverty in the city of philadelphia uh, children and youth um what can we do to begin to scale these numbers up? Because I do know that we have a, a, a number of slots based on um, the numbers that we have right now that you're displaying, but um, clearly we're, that's not even 20% of the young people who are living in poverty in the city of Philadelphia. So um, what, what should be our marching orders as we prepare for next summer to figure out how do we um, service those young people that are in need the most, especially considering some of the gun violence and other crime uh, crises that we're facing. We all know that the summertime is the time when we see the biggest spike when it comes to um, to, to uh, criminal activity. We know that a lot of times that's because young people do not have something positive to do. Um, I do also commend you and your team as well as um, um, Commissioner our level for the work that was done in collaboration with the school district. It was unprecedented. I know it was very difficult. Um, but we were able to scale up last year during a pandemic. So I'm wondering what lessons have we learned and what can we do to prepare for summer of 2022? Um, clearly, we won't be able to serve all 100,000 um, young people, but how can we how can we get more slots? How can we be a little better? Um, so thank you for that and, and thank you for the acknowledgement. I, I, I will um, I, I will take privilege to say that I'm not sure I'm going to miss all my council hearings, but I will certainly miss the work. <laughs> and I appreciate um, the partnership, right, no matter what um, or how difficult the conversations. It's always been with heart and honesty. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to start at the top where you mentioned the district. I think it was unprecedented that we did this school district partnership. Um, and I think since there is the opportunity through the federal funding that will remain at least for another uh, few cycles of summers that we should maximize and that with the pandemic and kids um, in school, the ability to do what we called like the summer school extended 
uh, program. So kids had academic learning in the morning and then they had activities. Um, I definitely think that is something that we should replicate. We were limited in our numbers because we were just coming, you know, out of the pandemic. Not all kids in that age group had the opportunity to be vaccinated. Now being able to go all the way down to the younger children, I think that there is a tremendous opportunity there to um, grow those numbers, right? And that gives parents a very solid chunk of time um, that's available. We've also... Um, been working closely with uh, the school district around space and use of space and use of gyms. And I think part of this is not just the organized activities that we plan, but I think what Council Member Thomas, you've done a fantastic job of doing as well as I know Bev Devine will be presenting later is how do we use all the folks who are moving and supporting all these different athletic programs? And how do we make sure that folks have access and availability to spaces? Um, and, and how do we help cross promote um, using the megaphone? You know, one of the lessons learned from the food access was the city doesn't have to do all, all of it, right? We can be sometimes the coordinator and convener for expanding services. Um, and then I would be remiss if I didn't say with both um, Councilwoman Kim and um, my dear colleague Charmaine and Shakima on here is our ability to look at what's the right number for work ready. How many kids do we have involved in a paid work activity, particularly when we talk about older youth. So on the front end, I think having as many opportunities as possible for the young and middle school aged is a focus and then how do we expand uh, the number of slots on the, the middle, the, the high school age kids. So um, I think we could work towards getting like, what does those numbers look like? Um, but I will say, I know I've been talking a lot and I'll say this last thing is that we do have gaps um, and we have gaps in, in two places. We have, not all of our slots are currently being utilized. Partially is because I think some families post pandemic have figured out other plans. Some folks are still weary. And then um, we've also still had staffing crisis in some of our providers, right? Not everybody's fully staffed yet, so that creates a, a dynamic. So one is that we got to get into a summer where we're maximizing every slot available. And I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you for your response. I, I couldn't agree with a lot of the things you said uh, more, especially the concern around slots. When I think about um, what high school students had to go through last summer, we tried to connect a lot of them. Um, and we knew uh, prior coming into the summer that the steps that high school students had to take in order to be employed uh, by, by the city of Philadelphia through the Work Ready Initiative was more difficult than what my staff had to go through to be hired to work in city council. Um, and that was something that we kind of wanted to deviate away from. I think that we did take some steps in the right direction last year. But I still believe the process was uh, a little too difficult for our high school students, which puts us in a position where we do not often um, um, have the ability to maximize these spots. Uh, so throughout the course of this work, I just want to continue to push folks around the application process for our high school students. I think we did a good job with the marketing side. Uh, we were folks were in the schools. Um, information was passed out. Students were aware that the option was available. Um, we know there were a lot of virtual things, but I think again, the paperwork and a disconnect with codes and the needing of employers and things like that. I think that put us in a position where young people um, were excited about it originally, but then as they went through the process, it was like, well, you know, I might as well go get a job at uh, somewhere in retail or something like that, where I can get a few more hours, make a few more bucks, and the process itself was. Um, a, a little um, wasn't as strenuous, uh, but simultaneously, we love our high school students in our programs because often our programs um, have enrichment components. That's not just about a salary that does more than just pay young people or occupy their time for the summer. It offers those valuable life lessons. And with all the different issues that young people are facing right now, the more enrichment opportunities we have for them, the better. Um, so just want to keep pushing the slot side as it relates to the uh, sports-based initiatives that you begin to talk about. I'm wondering um, how much money a year do we spend on OST initiatives? And then how much money are we spending on sports-based OST initiatives? 
So it's a, it's a great, and um, one part of that question is very easy to answer, the other one is har harder. So on the OST front, the total um, rounded up number of what we have is 20 million, um, $30 million, I'm sorry, I was gonna short change it. It's $30 million in OST. Now, some of those OST programs run- Debbie Mayor, I'm sorry, just for clarity purposes, but you're talking about this 30 million, you know, just for um, everyone that's listening, you're not talking about anything that has to do with the school district. This is just the city of Philadelphia, correct? Correct, this is the city of Philadelphia, it's $30 million in out of school time funding. Um, and that supports the network that I talked about um, that runs year round and summer. Now, um, the reason it's harder to give a number around how much in youth sports is that that gets reflected in a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, and so it's both in the parks and rec staffing, and I know um, the commissioner's on, she could answer this a little bit better. So what I had asked of your office is we'd like to spend a little bit of time um, it's not nearly, I will be very honest, not nearly the investment that goes into out-of-school time, but we've been looking at this from a national perspective in terms of how youth programs are funded across the country, and that obviously a big part of the work lives in the Parks and Rec system in terms of what we do in terms of space, rec leaders, um, as well as you know, our agreement with the school district in terms of how we permit gyms and how we support providers and not having to pay the district for use. So you could count that towards youth sports programming. So that's why I said, I don't wanna just throw out a number. Um, I will tell you it's not as significant as the OST, but we should probably get a better sense of like, how is that captured? Um, so for, for in the midst of um, capturing that data and that information for us, can it be broken down into categories? So, for example, when we think about uh, gym permits, I know firsthand as a former athletic director and as a coach, um, yeah. the cost that uh, the uh, Office of Parks and Recs have to absorb when right. you have, you know, 66 teams playing a varsity right. basketball in a public league. And that's just on the boys' side, not including girls and junior varsity. Then you move on to other sports like chair competition and wrestling. And we're only talking about winter sports. This is three seasons, right? They get real busy in the spring once that baseball and softball and track come around. And it's not like they're, they're dormant in the fall. Those type of dollars are great, right? And of course, when we're spending staff dollars, um, seasonal staff and things of that capacity, those are great as well, too. But what we want to see is specifically grant dollars. So when we think about, um, you know, such and such organization, um, the local football team that just came back from Florida, we had a number of teams in the area go to Florida over the last couple of weeks um, for national football competition. How many of those organizations are actual entities, uh, whether it's a 501c3 um, C3 or some type other type of entity who actually gets some type of uh, grant dollars um, from the city of Philadelphia that's not activity grant money um, that um, puts them in a position to be able to provide a quality athletic programming for young people. Um, so yes, the staffing side is a one dollar amount. The permit side is another dollar amount, but the grant dollars specifically is the number that um, we're curious about uh, because we um, have a hunch that we're not investing in um, athletics and sports that the way that we could be as a city. Uh, we won't know that until we know what the actual numbers are. And when you talk about prevention-based initiatives, um, I'm pretty sure that we all can agree that sports is a great means of prevention-based initiatives. And we do not offer enough athletic activities for young people in the city of Philadelphia that are free. We offer a lot, but not a lot are free. And if we know a 100,000 young people are living in poverty, we need more free uh, sports-based initiatives for our youth as we look to uh, do something about the gun violence crisis and the crime crisis we have in the city of Philadelphia. Um, I will stop right there because I'm pretty sure my colleagues have questions. I will also pass it to um, our Commissioner of Parks and Recs. I see her hand is up. Um, Commissioner, if you wanted to come in and um, um, communicate your, or, or add to the dialogue right now, that's fine. Um, council uh, colleagues, if anyone's having any questions, feel free to uh, put something in the chat feature or to raise your hand. Thank you, Councilman. I just wanted to um, offer some comments um, from uh, one of your previous questions about um, the slide that Deputy Mayor Figaro had up regarding um, the the um, numbers uh, in terms of participants in um, in the programs, and just to offer some additional commentary and perspective on that. Um, that was a you know, as, as Cynthia mentioned in some of her remarks, you know, I do think that we saw a um, 
uh, a down uh, lower numbers um, for it, I'm speaking specifically about parks and rec for summer camp and after school um, in 2021 specifically. Um, I think that was due in part number one to um, health department regulations that we still needed to cohort within our facilities. Um, so to minimize the mitigate the spread, um, especially when kids were not vac vaccinated, we had lower numbers due to um, due to the health precautions. Um, but to, to Deputy Mayor's um, point, I also think, and I know this anecdotally, um, that some parents were just still a little nervous. You know, their kids hadn't been back in school yet, um, and um, they they had you know sort of figured out what to do with their kids at home, you know, and so we're less likely to, um, to have their kids go back to a group, um, a group setting like that. Um, that said, um, you know, while we, sh we were showing there, you know, a total of 5,000, um, young people for after school and out of school time for parks and rec, um, this summer, I mean, we, we could hopefully God willing, go back up to our normal, um, you know, service, uh, level, which is between 7,500 and 8,000 children just for summer camp. And then an additional 3,500 to 5,000 kids for after school program. That's, that's a number that's more, reflective of what we were doing pre-COVID. So I just want to be clear that we see that there was a COVID lens on that. And I think it's going to be some time before we, you know, reach the, that nor new normal. Um, I also want to mention that um, some numbers that weren't reflected, but also really important from a programming perspective, even though they're in more informal programs, um, are the Play Streets program. So, you know, we, during COVID, amplified the Play Streets program so significantly, thanks to support from the YMCA and and dozens of other funders. We raised uh, over half a million dollars to amplify the Play Streets program. And we serve approximately 12,000 young people right on their blocks with meals and programming um, structure for them right outside their front door. Um, and then um, also our pool visits. So, you know, even though we had this significant labor shortage and lifeguard crisis, we still were able to serve uh, 350,000 young people um, at our swimming pools this summer, as well as um, free swim lessons. So um, I say all that just to give context that, you know, while there's formal programs like after school and summer camp, there's also the informal uh, connects that we have um, to young people throughout the city uh, that we can, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think those numbers will continue to increase as, um, you know, as we move back towards this new normal in a post-pandemic world. Thank you, Commissioner. Let me uh, follow up with some of the things that you said, um, just to see um, what we're doing to prepare for next summer. So you talked about um, some of the um, issues that we had around hiring of lifeguards. Um, I know firsthand <laughs> some of those issues. <laughs> I tried my best to help promote. Yes, and you encourage. did, Councilman. <laughs> um, you know, you guys had me drowning and everything, but you did. Um, yeah, it was it was a great. The councilman, for those who don't know, did 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 attempt to pass the lifeguard certification, and yeah. uh, it was a good attempt. It was a good attempt. That's the you were not thing. hired. Right. Um, but um, we did run into um, some issues around um, hiring. Uh, what, what are we doing to prepare for summer of 2022 uh, so we can put ourselves in a position where that hiring is, it, it is not an issue? Are we going to increase the wage for lifeguards? Are we going to get the word out earlier? I know you ran into some issues working with the school district around training <laughs> for those lifeguards. And um, that set you back um about a month or so as well too. Uh, what can we do now to begin to plan for the summer of 2022, thinking about the fact that you have all of our parks and recs as well as our pools. And we know that that's a place where young people like to convene and have some fun. Yeah, thank you. Um, we we are obsessively thinking about lifeguards and um, and pool season for uh, 2022. So last year was a perfect storm. Not only did we have um, a local labor shortage, right? As you said, you know, why sit out? Why why attempt to go through the certification process to become a lifeguard when you can go to you know Target and easily get a job um, and a discount, mind you? Um, and um, you know, so we had the labor shortage. We also have a national lifeguard shortage, and that is just a reality that um, parks and recreation directors across the country are dealing with, um, especially in cities. And that is just. Um, a trend away from the, um, you know, uh, the job of lifeguarding. And um, it's, it's a, it is a, it is a national crisis. It's not just something that impacts us here in Philadelphia. Um, our wages are actually very good. They're, they're, you know, we, we pay lifeguards at a higher rate than um, any of our counterparts locally um, and uh, comparable, if not more than what um, other municipalities pay. Um, but certainly what, what the other part of the perfect storm was that we, really didn't know if we were going to have a pool season 
because of the pandemic, right? We just didn't know. And it was so touch and go last winter. We st- we have got to start training lifeguards, you know, really by January 1st. I mean, we have got to be in full training mode if we're going to have a, a full pool season. And we just didn't know, um, you know, because of where the pandemic was, um, you know, if we were going to be able to do that. We found out early February that we were going to be able to have a pool season. And that's when we went, you know, full speed ahead trying to recruit train lifeguards, but that's late at that point. And keep in mind the summer before we didn't have a pool season. So we had no lifeguards um, who were returning. So we were basically starting with a clean slate. Everyone had to be newly certified because all the certifications ran out. Um, We had people who hadn't been in a pool for 18, 18 months, you know, so so like yourself, you know, the people who had been, hadn't been in a pool, um, you know, just really struggled um, with the qualifications. And, um, and then, um, so, so, and then we didn't have a place to actually train. So we, we were not able to get into the school pools where we uh, traditionally had been. And so we had to fill an outdoor pool uh, that you swam in and heat it so that we could begin training guards in, uh, in February and March outdoors. Um, and so this year, um, we have been working tirelessly trying to identify indoor pool locations where we can begin lifeguard training um, on January 3rd. And um, we have some some great partners um, that have um, offered the, us their services, including some of the local universities, the YMCA, um, Friend Select School. Um, so we have some good partners who have offered us space um, and um, we're creating a schedule of locations around the city. So not just you know, in one location, but at um, different indoor pools throughout the city where we'll be able to start training and certifying guards, um, you know, right after the first of the year. Um, we are very hopeful and I think we're very um, close to getting access to a school district pool as well. So um, I feel like we'll have a good training program in place. We will still need a lot of help recruiting guards, um, you know, but I'm hopeful that we'll be in a much different circumstance than this time last year. Thank you, Commissioner. I um, and you have my support. I'm going to train this time myself uh, prior to coming to take the test, so I'll be a little more prepared. Um, so anything that we could do on the council side to help uh, spread the word as it relates to lifeguards and the work that's going to be done in preparation for next summer, uh, please let us know. We're here. Um, the last thing I want to um, ask, and I don't see anyone else queued up, so I think that this might be the last question for this panel. Um, for those who are looking to provide quality programs for next summer? Uh, When could they begin to apply for grant dollars? When do those RFP goes out? Uh, What is the city's timeline as it relates to funding programs for next summer? And how do uh, you traditionally evaluate how people are selected and how uh, folks are retained if they've been um, awarded dollars in the past? I was on mute. Apologies. Um, So we have one more summer cycle um, in terms of the existing providers. So it's a three year grant cycle. So this will be the third um, third cycle of that. We have had some opportunities that have come up both for our community schools as well as um, OS additional OST slots that have become available for various reasons. Um, and so certainly when those opportunities come up, we send that both to the provider community through the, the contracting process. And we have reached out oftentimes to some of your offices to help get the word out, including some social media. Um, we've had direct conversations with some local community-based um, organizations who are very interested in getting and making sure that we send them directly or keep them in the queue in terms of just making them aware when opportunities become available. That's still very much Councilman Thomas, a traditional OST funding. So I think that you talked earlier about grant-based funding for athletic type programs. We don't have a, like a, a sig- we don't have a specific funding source for that. So that might be something I would put in your queue. <laughs> Um, and certainly we would we would work with you on what that what um, that would look like in terms of a, a city c- procurement process. Um, and then the work ready, um, Philadelphia Youth Network, who's our intermediary, can talk through just that process in terms of what we're doing in that space um, in terms of grant availability. And I think that co- I think that's that's where we are as of right now. Thank you. Uh, before I let you go, Chair recognizes Councilmember Brooks. 
Thank you so much, Chair Thomas. Um, I, I have a few questions, and I want to start um, about kind of connecting to what Councilmember Thomas said in reference to um, access and availability. I know during the summer, um, Catherine, you talked about Parks and Rec summer camps, and I was surprised to see like flyers for summer camps that had fee for services, and I think it was a deterrent to some parents and communities that did not have the money to be able to pay for camps. And I know that some camps did subsidies or just allowed kids to come anyway, but if the flyer said that the camp was $150, you know, it's, it was immediately discarded by some um, people in the community, um, even to the point that my team, we raised money to help support one particular camp to make sure they had kid, you know, that they had the money to cover kids that go to this camp. But, you know, I was I was really surprised by that. You know, we're talking about access and availability. And if parents are discarding the information because of a fee for services that eliminates the access to, um, you know, young people in communities. And to that point, mm -hmm. um, do you have an analysis of the availability and utilization of out of school time slots um, for camps and park and direct youth programs? Do you have them broken down by um, zip code and school catchment areas? Because what we realize is that um, we have school communities that need programs, you know, to kind of prevent vi as violence prevention methods. And if we don't have that information and data to look at, to share, you know, it's kind of hard for us to guarantee that the slots um, are available and the programs are available to young people in these communities. I can take the first part, Councilwoman, about um, the uh, the fees. So, yes, yeah, some of our um, some of our, our um, rec centers do charge uh, fees for the summer camps, and um, the you know our our, our um, request is that we turn no nobody away, um, you know, because they cannot afford the fee. The fee normally is minimal and covers you know ancillary costs that you know, are not covered. I mean, basically what we cover for summer camp is the staff. That's it. Right. And, and some supplies. Right. But, um, for trips and things like that, you know, that, um, you know, kids and parents have come to expect, you know, they're, they're often our additional fees, but we ask, you know, our rec leaders to ensure that nobody is turned away, you know, because they can't afford the fees or that they're also directed to grant programs for summer camps like Madeline Moore, which we get a ton of kids who access the Madeline Moore scholarships, which also helps to support us and our centers. Um, but I totally hear you when you're saying that, you know, if I, I might have sticker shock and I might see that it's $150 and if I don't have that $150, I'm not even going to consider it, right? So understood that we need to do a better job of how we market that and communicate that, um, you know, adding a line that says, you know, scholarships or sponsorships are, are available um, is something that we can absolutely and, and will absolutely consider. So I thank you for that. And we'll, we'll definitely make that, make that note for this summer. You know, and, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was sorry, <laughs> Council Member. I just, I, I don't want to inundate you, but we will send, I know because there was a special committee on gun violence and there were some really great questions asked about how many slots were available per zip code and how many were utilized. We have that, we submitted that earlier today. So we, we can send that to you as well, which literally shows you every single zip code, how many slots and how many were utilized. Um, and then I think we've been, you know, uh, Catherine walked through the, the um, she's being very um, diplomatic in that the rec program supports staffing. There isn't a robust project budget in terms of programming outside of staff. And so, for example, OST, we fund the program that's delivered by the provider and all of those are required by contract to be free. We actually asked providers um, almost two and a half years ago to start charging for any um, out of school time. So all the out of school time programs are completely free of charge. So is there any way for a partnership like that to be happening with uh, summer camp programming? Because I know, and I'm going to be very specific, and I know yep. Council Member Gim has been working on this with me. I live in 19140. So be clear. So when I'm talking about parks, I'm talking about parks in 19140. When I'm talking about schools, I'm talking about schools in 19140. And in order for us to curb the gun violence and offer kids something different, we need to have as much programming available 
for all children, but particular the children that are what from third grade and older who are in the beginning stages of possibly getting caught in high risk behaviors. And that's why it's important for us to see those numbers by zip code, but also it's important to make sure that if a parent had a choice of who they're going to pay for camp, they're not paying for a 12 year old because the 12 year old can stay home. But in reality, the 12 year old needs the services even more so. And I just want to make sure that when we're talking about funding program for out of school time program, that we're linking that to our actual summer camps and to council member Thomas's. So our, uh, athletic programs that are also associated with parks and recs because those programs are also drastically underfunded and the coaches are paying out of pocket. And, you know, we need to do a greater job of making sure particular young people in these high risk communities have all the possible resources they can to be successful and, you know, and eliminating barriers. And in reality, you know, whether it was $150, I think I saw that's an immediate barrier especially when you're a parent that have four children. And if you have to make a choice, the teenagers are not the choice. And to Isaiah's point, um, Council Member Thomas's point, we also need to make sure that those 12, 13 year olds have a transition in some kind of paid programming um, where they can be helpers or assistants and build those skills up. And I would like to see those type of programs intertwined, similar how you suggested with out of school time programs into our summer camp programs, because I've lost too many kids this summer, you know, and every summer, and we need to do more. And these are the conversations that people are stopping me on the street to have. And these are the convers conversations that spark me to raise money to fund the camp. Yeah. You know, no, and I you. think we need to do more. So I couldn't agree more. And I, just, with, with my departure, I would just say I, council has been incredibly supportive of, Parks and Rec, and I would just ask that you continue to be tremendous champions for the commissioner and that budget, because I do think that there's countless opportunities that we we absolutely should be doing camps that, that, that don't have to charge families for programming. And can you guys speak to the prioritization of um, these particular areas that I talked about and the prioritization of the partnering um, in these particular communities moving forward? Because like just earlier, someone said that camp is already here. I used to plan summer camp, but I know summer camp planning starts in January. Or well, sometimes so, December. <laughs> yeah. So we we have, um, again, so there's some overlay between this committee and the Special Committee on Gun Violence. So we have looked at the um, specific zip codes and prioritizing slots in that area. So we can certainly send that to you. But we have... Um, we do have a large percentage of our slots are in that. And we actually did an overlay, which is a map of our services and the high density areas. And we also overlaid the shootings um, and homicides so that, and it, um, I'm glad to say that everything tracks as, as we would want it. So we do see programming in, in those specific areas. So you'll be receiving that as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Brooks. And I do want to uh, echo her concern around zip codes and um, investing more money in the areas that need it the most. Um, if we can identify, and just to echo it, if we do identify areas um, that are um, those low income situations where um, we, we, we feel like we have to charge, uh, please communicate that to council because like Council Member Brooks said, we are often um, put in a position where we're able to find innovative and creative ways to offset those costs for children in neighborhoods, but we just have to know about it. And often we find out from constituents um, and not some of our colleagues in the city. So I just wanted to put an a emphasis and bold that particular point because um, that, that is a concern that we have across the board. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, to this panel. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, we will miss you. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we appreciate the great work that you're doing as well as the office of children and families. Mr. Clerk, can you please call? Oh, I'm sorry. Were there any other questions from any of my colleagues for this panel? Hearing none, I want to say thank you again. Mr. Clerk, would you please call uh, the next panel to testify? Yes, Chair. For the second panel, we have Shayna Terrell, Director of Pipeline Programming at the Center for Black Male Engagement. Good Greetings, afternoon. everybody. Please state your name oh. for the record and you can begin with your testimony. Hi, I 
am Shana Terrell. I'm director of pipeline programming at the Center for Black Educator Development. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, please excuse me. I'm about to pull over because I'm picking my daughter up from school <laughs> and I was trying to time the panel, but missed the time. Um, so for those of you who are parents, you definitely understand. I think most of this committee are parents. So we, uh, if there's any committee in city council that understands, I think this would be the one. Uh, but please uh, feel free to uh, proceed with your testimony. We'll be flexible for you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Greetings, city council members, community, fellow providers, and distinguished guests. Um, since the inception, since our inception of May 2019, the Center for Black Educator Development has been able to pilot and expand programming in the city of Philadelphia. At the center, we work on innovative and engaging ways to diversify the educator pipeline. We address educational inequities to improve academic and social outcomes for our students. Teacher diversity. Ooh, can you guys hear me? You're fine. Yes. You're fine. yes. Got it. All right, I was about to say, I feel like I lost you guys. All right, here we go. <laughs> through increased teacher diversity. One of the main ways we do this is through connecting young people to teaching apprentices opportunities with working with elementary, elementary age students and helping them to understand how teaching is connected to social justice. We seek to rebuild the black teacher pipeline by recruiting black high school students and college students into the field of education. Our flagship program, Freedom Schools Literacy Academy, is one of the opportunities the center offers for teaching apprenticeships for youth. Through our apprenticeships, we have been able to provide employment opportunities for youth of Philadelphia and have a positive effect on the literacy rates of elementary age students and work towards addressing the teacher shortage. In the past three years, we have had the opportunity to meet with members of city council, members of the mayor's office of children and families, members of the mayor's office of education, and members of the school district of Philadelphia. We have received verbal support, praise for our work and the opportunity to partner, and we are very appreciative. We want to highlight a few challenges we have experienced trying to expand our work with engaging youth and rebuilding the Black teacher pipeline. Challenge one, we haven't had much support with obtaining adequate and consistent funding for our programming. Since our launch in May of 2019, Philadelphia Youth Network has been one of our most consistent funding partners in Philadelphia. For the past three years, we have received funding from PYN to help fund our high school component for Freedom Schools Literacy Academy. We have employed over 70 high school students in the past three summers through PYN Summer Work Ready Programming. Sadly, beyond PYN, we have not been able to get an additional funding commitment from the city. That has limited us to what kind of programs we can provide and the number of summer sites we can actually operate. Our second challenge has been funding restrictions and streamlining processes. Though the funding from PYN has been a tremendous help in creating employment opportunities, it sometimes comes with restrictions. I do understand that the city has to provide priority has to provide funding for priority areas and priority populations. We are more than willing to engage with all youth. I think it would really help to streamline the process for engaging priority areas and priority populations. It really may help for agencies connected to those priority youth to be engaged with those opportunities prior to providers being engaged. It may help with recruitment and adding more support to make sure that youth have the appropriate information and additional support with the compliance of materials. Out of school time program programming service and high school students are also competing with food service and retail industries. Students may want to engage in our program, but need a job that will pay them higher wages or give them more hours. The city would need to consider increasing funding to make summer programs more attractive to youth. Overall, the process of getting funding and executing program implementation needs to be streamlined. RFP release dates need to be aligned with the summer and year-round experiences for students. Providers should be given adequate time to plan, recruit, and engage youth. Some of the current practices leave providers feeling like they are in a nonstop race with recruitment and implementation running all together, which is not always sustainable and doesn't always allow you to provide the best programming. Challenge number three funding information for non-traditional OST programs. We would like to have more access to how programs are funded and when funding is released. We know that many agencies and organizations in the city receive multi-year grants and funding from the city. We don't always have clarity on when RFPs will be released and who's eligible. In trying to attain funding, we have run into roadblocks of missing an RFP deadline or release date and funding not being open again for multiple years. 
because we operate a more specific program and not a traditional after school program, it's sometimes not always clear how to get adequate funding to support our programming. We would love to hear best practices on how to become one of those agencies. We want more guidance on finding where and who to engage to get adequate funding for programming that can provide employment opportunities for students during out of school time, but is but doing an out of school time program that isn't really considered a traditional after school program. And challenge number four, additional resources. Though funding has been a major challenge, getting additional resources has also been a struggle. Being able to access program spaces or receive things such as materials, trip sponsorships, or nutrition support has also posed some challenges. Thank you for your time. We hope that this hearing will lead to increased funding for OST programming, a streamlined process that will better support youth, and ways to make funding more accessible to non-traditional out-of-school time programs. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I don't know what your time schedule look like. Are you able to answer questions, or should we let you go? I was saying thank you for your testimony. Are you able to answer questions, or should we let you go? Yes. Nope, I'm able to answer questions. Okay, so um, first question, um, and then I'll open it up to my colleagues if any members of the committee has any questions. Um, we're having this conversation now in preparation for the summer of 2022. I'm thinking about what you do, not just in OST, but um, in the summertime, and also thinking about how effective uh, your programming is for high school students. Uh, when do you start planning uh, for uh, what your summer is going to look like? And what are those initial steps that you take as it relates to planning for uh, the summer? Um, we break it down into several components. Um, we start planning for the summer around now. I think we started our conversations at the end of October um, and really streamlining and planning because we have to know from a funding perspective how many sites we're actually going to operate, which then leads into how many people we're actually going to have to employ. Um, so from a funding perspective, sometimes I would like to know what kind of funding I'm going to have for the following summer, at least by August. But then we start planning program operations at the end of October and we start um, recruiting um, at the end of January, beginning of February. Thank you. I think that that's an important part because I know a lot of people are wondering why are we having a conversation in December about the summer of 2022? And I think the reason we thought it was important to have this conversation now is because this is when people who provide quality programming in the summertime are, are really putting the meats and potatoes together as it relates to what those summer programs are going to look like. So for us on the council side, I think it's important that we hear this information as well as the various departments in the city of Philadelphia who are responsible for funding and providing facilities and things of that capacity to recognize that the planning is starting now. And if we're going to have a successful summer next year, we need to make sure that we are well ahead of where we were last year and the year before. Uh, my second question before I open it up to um, some of my colleagues on this committee, uh, what uh, do you do in the midst of your programming that make you have so much success, not just with black men across the board, but specifically with high school students? Um, we're seeing a huge spike in crime um, in the city of Philadelphia and a lot of the crime that we're seeing committed are, are young people um, that are under the age of, of 18. Uh, Council Member Brooks talked earlier to the first panel and one of the things she said that I felt like was absolutely true is if a parent has to choose between a 12 year old and a you know a younger sibling to go to some type of programming, uh, the parent is going to choose the, the younger sibling because the 12 year old can stay by themselves when in actuality uh, the state of our city right now the 12 year old probably needs the programming more than anybody. So what do you do that's so effective as it relates to um, being able to engage and work with um, teen um, age young people and what can be replicated based on the work that you do? Um, one of the main things we do with young people um, is our programs are culturally proficient, meaning helping young people to understand um, themselves and their positions in the world and understanding that they have agency, they have voice, um, and they can make a difference. Um, our programs really invite young people to take a role of leadership um, in their community and change the things that they're seeing. So even though our program is mostly focused on education, we know that a lot of the gun violence problems, a lot of the problems that we see in the city with our young people are directly connected to the type of education and the type of the support that they're receiving um, from the adults around them. So our program makes sure that uh, we ensure that 
the young people have the support they need, but also teaching them that they have the agency um, to make the change. Uh, we have an intergenerational component to our programming, which allows high school students to interact and engage with college students, as well as elders and current professionals. Um, the other thing that we do is teach young people how to use their voice and how to advocate for change. Um, but more than just a performative level, they have an academic component that they also engage in where they have to research issues, research problems, um, and not just locally, but also globally. So looking at global movements and things of that such to see what they can learn and take to make change right here in their community, in their neighborhood. But one of the the, the two things that I highlight that I think that we do well um, to breed success to young people is one, cultural proficiency. So helping them understand themselves and their place in the world um, and who they are. And then two, giving them the opportunity to lead um, and letting them lead the way. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions from members of this committee for this particular panel? Uh, seeing none, I want to say thank you for your testimony here today. Please make sure you uh, pick up uh, your, 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 your child safely, and we appreciate She's you. Here. She's here. There She's you here. go. There you go. <laughs> Moms get the job done. Where's council member Catherine Gil Gilmore Richardson? Thank you. Uh, we appreciate your testimony here today. Um, and we thank you for the work that you're doing with young people across the city of Philadelphia. Um, before we call the next panel, Mr. Clerk, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that council member Alan Dom has joined us. Thank you, council member Dom. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can you please call the next uh, panel uh, to testify before us here today? Yes, on the next panel, we have Shakima Omar Townsend, Charmaine Matlock Turner, and Beth Devine. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record, and you may begin with your testimony. And we're going to allow each witness to testify consecutively. Thank you, Councilman Thomas. Chairwoman Gim, Vice Chair Thomas, and members of the committee, I'm the president and CEO of the Philadelphia Youth Network where we work every day to ensure education and employment opportunities are available to young people in Philadelphia. Our vision is to use education and employment experiences to interrupt the cycle of poverty by equipping young people with the skills and mindsets they need to thrive in their chosen career path. Together with our partners, many organizations like Urban Affairs Coalition and Center for Black Edu Educators, which you just heard from, we have provided more than 225,000 education and employment opportunities since our inception in 1999. We are eager to work with partners, including lawmakers like yourself, to implement additional measures to attract more young people and offer more streamlined, diverse experiences in summer 2020. A recent study conducted by, re by researchers at the University of Michigan found that a variety of benefits from summer youth employment programs, including specifically Work Ready Philadelphia, which was highlighted in the research as an exemplar, um, are relevant for, for our desire to continuously improve programs and make them more accessible to our young people. The study found that the benefits of Work Ready were highest for those young people with the most extreme barriers to future success, like those involved in the juvenile justice system and or foster care. We should be proud as a city that our practices are lauded and seen as best practices, but we also know that we can do better. Summer 2021 brought the opportunity to have many young people return to in-person or hybrid experiences that were not possible during 2020. In PYN's Navigating Summer 2021 report, you can see that despite the challenges associated with COVID and vaccine distribution, 6,600 Philadelphia youth participated in programming in 2021, which is more than we served in 2020. Though those young people earned $4.89 million in compensation, which we also know is a benefit to our local economy as young people contribute to their families' incomes and spend locally at home. Among the students who participated, 94% rated their summer experiences with satisfaction. This year, PYN had 85 youth serving providers, 673 work sites across 21 different industries participating in programming to engage young people. 
A few more successes that you should know. We launched a, a customer service center, um, which received more than 7,800 incoming calls because we understand that it can be a challenge to navigate the steps to secure employment. And those steps are similar, and some of them are not de designed or designated by us to work in this country. You have to complete an I 9, you have to have a permit if you're a young person, you have to complete a uh, W 4, and the state requires that young people um, complete clearance which we know can be cumbersome and challenging. And so we want it to be there for young people on the phone and through the computer. We also um, launched how-to videos and used social media to educate as many as possible. We also had a program locator like OCF talked about earlier, which helped young people to find programs. And 85% of the applicants had a referral call in comparison to 40% the year before. That's more than double. And so I understand Councilman Thomas talked about the codes can be confusing and we're seeing some progress by making those codes more available and more importantly, the programs. But we also heard from young people that while the access to the information was helpful, they want more information in order to make the best choice. In the same study I mentioned previously, researchers also found that individualized supports that PYN has implemented to help youth complete the application process were effective at targeting the most vulnerable youth who were least likely to enroll. It's also important to note that 704 young people participated in entirely virtual programming um, this summer because we listen to young people. And when young people uh, reference their concern about participating because of COVID and due to the violence in their communities, we thought it better that they have access to some services than none at all by requiring or forcing them to be in person. Um, we recognize that there are challenges and we are open to working with our partners to address them. Um, many providers and young people had trouble completing the application because it was all 100% virtual. And while we recognize that digital literacy and fluency will be a required skill for the future workforce, we also know that coaching, training, and easy to use technology is important as well. We shifted our application process. We tried to support the, uh, virtual, the virtual documentation collection, but we did that amidst uh, vaccinations not necessarily being available to young people. In fact, 16-year-olds uh, were not eligible for vaccination until May, and we started our application process in March. We did that while schools were closed, which we typically rely on schools and adult practitioners to get the word out. And we did that amongst the staffing shortages of our nonprofit providers who, too, were challenged with the space rec uh, requirements and implementing services during COVID. Lastly, I want to acknowledge, because there's been a lot of conversation about utilization, that PYM received 13,000 applications, which are it's much less than we're traditionally used to. And we saw unprecedented competition for unsubsidized jobs for young, for teen talent this summer. And that is different, uh, unlike any other summer before. Um, we also want to recognize that our em employer community was very helpful, but many of them had not returned to in-person work, which presented challenges for finding sufficient in-person work sites for young people. Many were still operating fully remotely or not allowing outside visitors into their workspaces, which created a challenge for us. We developed a virtual internship toolkit to support employers so that they did not have to not participate, but they could transition and still engage young people in, in, in learning the skills. And then lastly, I would acknowledge that clearances continue to be cumbersome for both youth and employers who serve as adult supervisors. And while we resolutely believe in protecting young people, we think that the process needs improvement to be more accessible to young people. I will stop there because I have lots of information and questions. I mean, lots of information, but I will pause because I know we have other people on the panel. Thank you. Um, oh, well, our next witness, please state your name for the record. You may begin with your testimony. If you're not talking, can you please mute yourself? Thank you, Councilman. Good afternoon, uh, uh, committee chair and council member Helen Gem. Vice Chair and our leader today, Council Member Isaiah Thomas, other members of Council who are here um, as a part of the Children and Youth Committee, and certainly uh, all members of Council. My name is Charmaine Matlock Turner. I am the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Urban Affairs Coalition. 
UAC has been a trusted partner for 52 years with the city, private and corporate sectors, and diverse low and moderate income communities to address long-term and emerging quality of life issues. UAC is a founding member of the Ending Racism Partnership, which is a citywide collaboration to end racial injustice and economic inequality and endorses the adoption of a diversity, equity, and inclusion framework to advance an equitable Philadelphia where laws, policy, and human interaction are governed by a common belief and our shared equality, irrespective of race, nationality, ethnicity, or skin color. UAC is a home to more than 80 other not-for-profit organizations and projects whose work address a myriad of issues that immediately affect Philadelphia's community and at-risk youth, including out-of-school time programs and activities and their residual ability to serve as an intervention to prevent violence. Thank you for the opportunity to offer comment on your resolution examining out-of-school time programs and funding for the summer of 2021 which targets improvements towards safety and positive life outcomes for Philadelphia's young people for 2022 and on. UAC is a longtime advocate of out of school time programs. Through directly administering its summer youth employment programs, thank you, Shakima and PYN, for your great partnership previously served as fiduciary for the city's OST efforts or as fiscal sponsor for UAC program partners operating OST programs offered after school and during the summer. These OST programs and activities are intended to provide youth a safe space to go with adult supervision and a set of enrichment experiences that help youth build background knowledge, explore career interests, earn a summer stipend, and develop financial budgeting, socialization, and occupational skills. As you know, access to and the funding of OST opportunities doesn't always get shared equally when we look at the needs in our communities. An increased and adequate public investment in high quality OST program for low-income youth can certainly make a huge difference in their lives and preventing the kind of issues that we see when children are left alone, unaccompanied, unloved, uncared for, and without hope. Programs primarily serving students from low-income families rely heavily on public funding as we've discussed. Despite a generally high level of support for, for public investment, Funding streams for OST are not enough. More funding is needed for PYN and others to make sure that we are eliminating all of the issues that ultimately stand in the way of success for our young people. OST programs, as you heard, are both beneficial and impactful. We believe demonstrating the following. After school programs improve the supervision and safety of youth, such as the OST programs of UAC, UAC partner, be it lead, our roots after school leadership program at Howard Furness High School, serving grades nine to 12, and Yo ACAP's operation of three OST programs, including its Finishing Trades Institute for Carpentry, Plumbing, and the Electrical Trades. Programs with an intentional focus on improving youth behavior, social and emotional well-being are successful, such as UAC's program partner, Philadelphia Ballhawks, and UAC's, as you've heard from Shakima, Summer Youth Employment Program. UAC program partner, Philadelphia Ballhawks, is a neighborhood basketball program serving fourth through high school aged young men and women in Philadelphia. Like many community athletic programs, the Ballhawks are on a mission to provide a comprehensive experience to develop young men and women of strong moral character, 
empower them to develop to the fullest of their athletic abilities, as well as promote educational, social, and cultural growth. UAC has led the initiative to provide summer employment for more than 50 years in the city of Philadelphia. And in partnership with the Philadelphia Youth Network, they stand ready to continue to support young people between the ages of 14 to 18 and above who need a paid summer experience in order for them to continue to grow. Even while challenged by the pandemic, we at UAC, as a partner of PYN, were able to place more than 18, more than 800 young people ages 14 to 21 at more than 100 different work sites across the city during the summer of 2021. Again, with our great partner, PYN, UAC has also formed the Summer Youth Employment Cabinet. Someone asked, when do we get started on summer? We get started on the next summer in August and begin our process of making sure that we are collaborating and bringing together citizens to work on these issues. Our cabinet is made up of 35 concerned citizens who volunteer to tell the story both at, with government, with the private sector and the community that we can all be work ready for our Philadelphia teens. And I wanna thank you as a result of your new normal jobs initiative from last summer. Thank you again to the council members who led that effort, including Councilwoman Sanchez and Councilman Johnson. Work Ready was able to gain additional funding of $1.87 million, which was certainly needed to make sure that we could reach as many young people as possible. This year, the cabinet's goal, however, remains the same. We will not stop this work until we get to full employment. Shakima just said that 13,000 young people applied in the middle of the pandemic. We have seen the numbers as high as 18,000. And we believe that every young person in the city of Philadelphia deserves an opportunity to be able to do and dream and have a worthwhile summer experience. This is a $30 million price tag, but we believe that the investment is absolutely worth it. And we urge you to make sure that we ultimately get to a place where we say to every teen, we see you, we got you, the opportunity is here for you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to sh share and talk today about the importance of out of school programs. But before I take any questions, I do have one other note to share. UAC lost and the city of Philadelphia lost a longtime leader and program extraordinaire leader, Arthur, or as we called him, Art Bowser, who passed away on December 5th. Art founded the Philadelphia Ball Hawks organization in 2003 with a goal to reach youth at risk that need direction through basketball. Art was a proud Temple University alum and was a big homecoming organizer. An avid Philadelphia sports fan, Art was known to love the Eagles, Sixers, Flyers, and Phillies all the same. Notable alums of the Philadelphia Ball Hawks include former NBA players, Hakeem Warwick, Dion Waiters, a former NFL player, Jamal Custis, as well as former Syracuse University stars Rick Jackson and Scoop Jardine. A conservative estimate credits the Ball Hawks with over 30 alums that went on to attend college. The Ball Hawks also have had females in their program and they boast of Ashley White as one of their star alums who now has created a similar program in Florida. Art is remembered for his passionate approach to helping youth, no matter the talent and background. It is people like Art and all those others who get up every day, whether they're in their car picking up their daughter from school or whether or not they are seeing a young person on the corner and reaching out and saying, hey, you wanna catch this fall? Hey, you wanna have a summer job? It is the arts of the world that we must support to make sure 
that we can create the kind of opportunity to says to all 100,000 young people who are living in poverty in our city, we see you, we got you. Thank you very much and I'm willing to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. With our last panelist, uh, please state your name for the record and begin with your testimony and then we can open up to uh, panels from members of this committee. I mean, questions from members of this committee. Hi, my name is Beth Devine, and I am the executive director of the Philadelphia Youth Sports Collaborative. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank uh, Councilwoman Gim, Councilman Thomas, and the members of the Committee on Children and Youth, as well as other council members in attendance and fellow panelists for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, the Philadelphia Youth Sports Collaborative is a, a, a collective of more than 60 nonprofit providers who deliver sports-based youth development programs in every zip code in the city, and we serve over 65,000 kids collectively. For many in our youth sports community, this past summer was the first chance to be back in person with kids and to have the opportunity once again to use healing-centered, trauma-informed sports as a tool to re-engage and support our young people. For the school district and city government, it was, you know, the uh, first time to working to actively reopen and reprogram some of our school spaces since the pandemic began. We had the opportunity not only to work with the Office of Children and Families to provide sports and fitness equipment, sports curriculum, online training, and a mobile app to support all 55 locations that's, that the city and the school district were able to get stood up. We also represented a number of our member organizations who provided cohorts at so several of these locations. From our perspective, last summer was an unprecedented effort that understandably came with its various challenges for our providers and for everybody, frankly. <laughs> um, as an intermediary, our job is to make sure that member providers are prepared to access funds like this to deliver quality programs in both summer and during the school year as well. And we'll continue to do that as we navigate the ongoing return to play. We believe that the funds supporting this work over the coming summer and school year present an unprecedented opportunity, and we have to start as soon as possible to coordinate and plan to ensure that next summer offers many more robust programs in as many spaces as possible. I don't have to really dive too deep into why our kids need this. I think we all know uh, the whys of this work. Um, for the summer of 20, two, 2022, uh, we know that only a coordinated effort between the administration and city council, city agencies that serve our kids, like many of those here, the school district and the providers themselves will result in a successful effort to ensure kids have equitable access to safe, effective programs. At a time where neighborhood violence is at an all time high, and in light of the Surgeon General's recent report on youth mental health, it is critical that we provide children with the robust network of activities in safe spaces that are run by trained, caring mentors. As such, the, the nonprofit provider community must be considered an extension of the city and school district staff. Uh, we are responsible for the care of our children in so many places across the city. As Deputy Mayor Figaro pointed out, we've seen the provider community respond to the call to provide access centers, summer programs, and now they're back in schools running in-person activities. We would like to see this robust ecosystem work hand in hand with the city to overcome hurdles, improve communication, better coordinate programmatic efforts and collectively receive the critical funding to provide these essential services. Uh, to, to close, I, I know we've met with several council members to discuss our role in the city and our mission of providing equitable access to quality sport for development in every neighborhood. To be effective, we need our incredible partners at Philadelphia Parks and Rec to have their funded re funding restored to pre-pandemic levels. We need all youth facing city agencies and the school district to join with us to make Philadelphia the national leader in healing centered trauma informed sport. We know sports works. We are a national leader already with a coordinated effort. It, it won't even be close. Philadelphia will be way ahead of the map, everybody else on the map. So we ask um, to continue to get the key people around the table as soon as 2022 begins so that we can start working on summer and working on uh, giving our kids the summer and the school year that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Chair recognizes Council Member Brooks um, for questions for this panel. I just have one quick question. I know that Shakima, I can't think of your folklore. I'm messing up. I don't want to mess up your full name. But I know you were talking about specified funding. 
I just wanted to make sure that it's guaranteed. Like, is there any prioritization taking place for one I one for all three, two, and other areas that have been hit by gun violence? Yes, yeah, so we work with the um, o OCF and also had the opportunity to talk to every, almost every council member before the program started to ensure that we were clear about the priorities, understanding the reports. Councilwoman um, Gim of, uh, offered me a report that I was able to overlay the priorities in terms of both foster care for young people, young people who were um, adversely affected by violence, in, including by schools and by zip codes, because sometimes it actually covered different groups of young people. Um, and so we were able to make some priorities. But I will say that while we set aside funding and slots, there is still the ability to meet the criteria in terms of for work. And so the challenge, I think we have the system to designate funding, but we need more resources for professional development, coaching and support of young people so that we can get them through the process steps. Thank, thank you so much for that. And I also want to highlight, I think we had a long conversation and I talked about how I so impressed I was with uh, the program that one of my young people attended in North Philadelphia. And I just want to thank you guys for continuing to fund these programs and offer these opportunities for young people. And extending from that, she decided to even go through the out-of-school time program after school in the fall. And that was huge, you know. And I'm speaking from my 13-year-old who's a teenager. And she even recruited friends to attend with her. So, you know, I think it's important that we put out that we have quality out-of-school time programs in the city. And a lot of times folks think that just because a program is targeting young people from that are at risk or from low income communities, that it isn't quality program. And I just wanted to also add to the record that we're talking about high quality programs that young people want to be a part of. And I want to thank you for the work that you guys are doing over there. Thank you, Councilmember Brooks. I appreciate your questions. I do commend PYM for the work that's being done. I also want to always, as always, uh, volunteer my office as a work site. Uh, for high school students again um, in the summer of 2022. Um, but again, we just want to push you on the uh, application process. I know I said it before in my last remarks. Um, I know uh, Charmaine and her team does great work over there as well, too. Um, the application process is always somewhat something that's tedious and just trying to uh, contemplate and brainstorm what can we do to continue to reevaluate, reinvent ourselves and put us in a position to be able to hire as young as many young people as possible is one thing to say we want to fund more slots which i think uh we should but it's hard for us to be able to make that argument to the administration and to other entities when we're not filling um the spots that we have now so please use this uh, myself my colleagues on this committee please use us as a resource to be able to assure that um we are addressing um the the needs of young people specifically our teens who are, are often looking for quality employment and enrichment programs, similar to what Council Member Brooks just talked about. Are there any other questions from members of this uh, committee for this particular panel? Well, Beth, I want to say thank you to you and your team uh, for the work that's being done around sports. Uh, I talked about the void that exists earlier when we were on the first panel, uh, specifically looking at the lack of funding and the lack of resources. Of course, um, uh, Ms. Charmaine Madlock Turner, the great work you do, but I also want to thank you for um, bringing and raising up uh, Mr. Arthur Bowser because um, he is um, a pillar in the sports world here in the city of Philadelphia. We appreciate um, the work that he has done, and I'm sure his legacy will live on uh, based on um, the great name he built for himself and the work that he had done. So I want to say thank you to everybody on this panel. We appreciate you being here to provide your expert opinion. And more importantly, we appreciate the work you do as it relates to servicing uh, children and families across the city of Philadelphia. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, can you please call our next panel? Yes, for our final panel, we have Raheem Thompson, Eric Worley, Dr. Sharice Godwin, and Jasmine Smith. Um, we'll, we're going to do the same thing for this panel we did for the last panel, which is allow you to testify consecutively. So, um, uh, Mr. Thompson, you're up first. Please state your name for the record, and then you may begin with your testimony. My name is Raheem Thompson. I'm the founder of the Chosen League, which is a youth, a citywide youth basketball league. The Chosen League have provided an environment showcasing basketball talent for over 3,500 Philadelphia youths 
male and females, the past 20 summers. Councilman Thompson, Councilman Thomas has been a supporter and advocate of the Chosen League since 2008, before he was an elected official. His purpose in the Chosen League mission blended perfectly of providing productive summer programming for the children of Philadelphia to uplift them and pro provide them with positive experiences to carry over into the upcoming school year. Funding of these programs like Mines and also the Ball Hawks, PYN, and different programs for use in the city is crucial. Councilman Thomas is the perfect lead for this because he has been involved on various levels, including his own annual Thomas and Wood Foundation camp, which we have been a supporter of. With the increase in violence due to the pandemic, economic support of programs like Mines and others on this call, are, which are staples in the community, are more vital than ever. These programs provide structure and hope for children and peace of mind to the parents during the time of the year when it's easy to be influenced by negativity due to the free time, which is summertime. We can make change by making sure these programs have the financial resources and support a local government that is needed to make significant impact on the thinking of the youth in a positive light. And just to continue off of what I just said, the negativity that's happening in this city recently has affected my program on a very personal level. I have had kids that, that have been a part of this program who have been killed. I have had kids a part of this program who was the shooters. I have had kids a part of this program who parents are suffering because of the violence in the city. And to be on this call like this, it's an honor, first of all, to be on this call but I'm glad I had this platform to talk because we have Eric Worley on here. I'm very close friends with Art. May he rest in peace. I know Art for over 16, 17 years. I'm very, this Chosen League, we deal with the entire city. Every zip code has participated in the Chosen League. And the reason why we need funding the way we need funding in the summertime is because we are underfunded. We are overlooked by a lot of different things. It's because of my respect for Councilman Thomas as I'm on this call. Because my league used to be at 10th and Nonley for almost 16 years. And the reason I left 10th and Nonley was because the city wasn't providing me support at all. People seen the, the private donors I had, and they thought that we was making all this money. Well, what people don't understand, like Ms. Charmaine was saying earlier, we put more time in, this, in these programs than, than we do with our own family. We, put, we give kids access to certain, certain experiences. We pay kids to work in the summertime. We provide opportunities to children. We feed kids. People sleep at our house. There's a lot that come with this. I have two young daughters. I have a daughter that's 10, and I have a daughter that's 8, and I've been married for 12 years, and I'm also a priest. So my life is nothing but servicing. While we've been on this call, I have purchased about 120 coats for a family shelter that I'm taking care of this weekend for Christmas. So this is very near and dear to me, and I might get a little emotional talking, because we need funding, and we are severely underfunded, underfunded. And to be honest with you, if it wasn't for Councilman Thomas, I wouldn't be on this call. Because in all the years I've been doing this, which has been over 20 years, I have not had support from city government the way I think I should, I have earned. Now, people see the deals with Nike, they see the deals with Mitchell and Ness, they see the video game deals, but they don't understand. So to run a proper summer league costs almost fifteen to $20,000 a summer. And that's just paying referees, buying uniforms, buying basketballs, feeding people, this, that, and the other. But what do you do when that kid comes to you at nighttime who took his last little bit of money and rolled from southwest Philadelphia down to 10th and Nani, and now he's telling you he has no money to go home? Now I have to pay somebody to drive from the southwest, make sure I pay the person to drive from the southwest, feed him, and make sure he's okay for the next game. We give out thousands of pairs of sneakers. Eric Worley can testify that. There's not a program, a basketball program in this city that I haven't helped out in some way. So the funding that's needed for the summertime, it was a question that was asked earlier with OTC, I think it was, and it was like, what funding goes towards the sports programs? It, we need to be prioritized. Excuse me. We need to be taken more seriously because there's a lot of children we're saving. When I took this league out of 10th and Nile the violence in my, and, and I live in the 19141. I still live in the same area where I took my league out of. The violence increased. And I have a relationship with the 35th District, with the lieutenant, with everyone over there. And they told me, Raheem, the moment you took this out of, out, out of the neighborhood, the violence increased. And I had to take it out of the neighborhood. It wasn't by choice. But at the time, I was getting bullied by the city. They were telling me I couldn't do private donors. If I did private donors, the money had to run through them. 
But I'm like, I'm working every day, 24-7, 365 days to provide for my community. Instead of taking from me, why don't you provide me with some real support? And I'm not talking about $1,500, $3,500. These programs are expensive that we deal with. And when you're talking about dealing with teenagers, you're not just dealing with a teenager. You're dealing with the whole family. Because in my community, Eric Worley could testify that there have been plenty of people I have employed. There have been plenty of people at tournaments that I have done. There have been plenty of things I did for the Ballhawks. And all I'm asking is for you all to look at this through a perspective of if you, if you live it in the community. It's dangerous where I live at. Every day I have to worry about my children. I live in a pretty good environment. Thank God I'm blessed. Nothing has happened to my family. But during this pandemic, it has been very, very challenging because I'm losing funding. Other programs are losing funding, but people still need help. I still got to do my Thanksgiving Day dinners. I still got to do my Christmas holidays give back. I still got to do my, just my normal monthly dinners that we give to people in need. So all I'm asking is when y'all go to the table and y'all look at these budgets, don't think $5,000, $10,000 is a lot of money because it's not. These programs, we all need at least a minimum of fifty to hundred thousand dollars to to move the way we need to move. And I'm not, and I'm grateful for for this conversation, but I just gotta be honest with y'all. Y'all have to have to help us more. If you want to curb the violence in Philadelphia, I do. Like I said, I have had kids that have been killed. I have had kids that have been the shooters, and I have, and so I have dealt with both sides of the family. Families that, and because the thing about this, when someone get killed. Everyone is traumatized. The shooter family's traumatized and the victim family's traumatized. And you never know who in that family, that murder never goes away. And I had to, and I had to de deal with this so much during this pandemic that it actually got to the point where I started getting sick behind it. Because it's like, you have to try to keep a family calm. You got to make sure this, that, and the other. Then you got to turn around and make sure this family's calm. But then at the same time, I have to take care of my family at the same time. And then I bring that into the house. So please, when you go and you look at our programs that you see, understand we need help. That's the point of being an elected official, is to take care of your constituents. And I am asking, 19141, 19140, 19121, these zip codes where this violence is at, this can be controlled. The reason this violence is happening, because these kids don't see opportunity. They don't, see, they don't have hope. They feel like no one cares about them. And the ones that care about them, they see us struggling. So I don't want to take up too much time. I'm sorry. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Excuse me, Councilman, for going too long. Thank you, Ryan, for your testimony. You're fine. Um, I think that those are the things that people need to hear. We appreciate your expert opinion, and we'll open it up to questions for this panel once everyone has finished their testimony. Mr. Clerk, can you call the next witness, and then we'll allow each witness on this panel to testify consecutively. Yes, the next witness is Eric Worley. Uh, yes, hello, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. State your name for the record and you may begin with your testimony. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Eric Worley. I am uh, the co-founder and director of neighborhood-based programs with uh, Philadelphia Youth Basketball. And I guess first, thank you to uh, Councilman Thomas for uh, the invitation to uh, this uh, very uh, much needed conversation. And uh, I guess I can start by letting everyone know I can absolutely attest to a lot of the things that the gentleman, Raheem Thompson, that just went before me was speaking to. Very, very familiar with all of his work over the last 20 years with his League of Tefanoni and a lot of the uh, personal resources and private resources that he has poured into the community. I've uh, seen it firsthand and also would like to echo uh, the, the salute to uh, uh, Coach Art, Big Art, as I called him. You know, great, great gentleman who did uh, great work down in the South Philadelphia community. Uh, just uh, my testimony uh, as the co-founder and the director of neighborhood-based programs, I've had the pleasure of partnering with several colleges and universities in the city to host what we call our summer camp series for the last five years prior to COVID. Uh, but just like most youth serving organizations, COVID caused places like St. Joe's, Temple University, LaSalle, Jefferson University, et cetera, to disallow outside groups from using its campus facilities. With young people being out of school and disconnected socially for over the year, uh, the school district of Philadelphia, when they started to allow access to its facilities to deserving program providers to re-engage our city youth during the summer 2021, uh, PYB accepted that opportunity to pivot 
and provide our summer camp series on the campuses of uh, two school district schools with great excitement. We re-engaged up to 75 young people in fifth through eighth grades, uh, 75 young people at the Carver Engineering and Science High School in North Philadelphia, and about 75 young people each week at the Grover Washington Middle School for about six weeks each location this past summer. So in our experience with our partnership with the school district, I believe outside of like some early miscommunication as it pertained to like the availability of a few of the school choices that we wanted to partner with early on, uh, the process of collaborating with the school district of Philadelphia worked out well and provided great access and opportunity for us to continue to provide a quality summer camp program to the young people of our city. So I think similar to most on the call, I think we are all... Uh, familiar with the need that our young people have in our city. For us here at Philadelphia Youth Basketball, we are looking forward to uh, continuing our partnership with the School District of Philadelphia, having some clarity as it pertains to the process and the access uh, that will be available to us uh, at some of the school district buildings. Uh, although this was our first year hosting our summer camps inside of the school district schools, uh, we were uh, happy with the process and we were uh, pleased with how things went. So we are eager to uh, learn more about the possibilities that will be available to us as a program provider for the summer of 2022. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, will the next witness please state your name for the record and you may begin with your testimony and we'll save questions for the end of this panel. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Cherise Godwin. I just want to send a greetings to city council members, committees, panelists, and all of the guests here today. Um, so basically, I'm here today to advocate for resources for children in youth-based sports programs in the city of Philadelphia. I'm not here representing a particular organization at this point in time, but I do want to express my, my interest um, in making this happen in, in this application. Um, but nonetheless, I'm a Temple University professor and I'm also a lecturer, policy expert and Hall of Fame um, inductee at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a global uh, humanities and program developer and I am also um, just very interested and I'm an advocate so since last summer, um, I realized that there are many funding agencies and initiatives for youth, but there's limitations for children and youth in and around sports. Um, and as Councilman Thomas indicated, there's a correlation between having a positive outlet um, for children and youth and a better life and educational outcomes. So some of the grand challenges that I've witnessed <laughs> is basically a high rate of gun violence as we all have testified and kind of basically talked about today um, with 267 children and youth um, dying from gun violence and 528 homicides uh, collectively in the city of Philadelphia, which was 29 more people than the previous year. And we still have 17 days remaining in the year of 2021. And I say this because there is um, there's fear here for children and youth here in the city of Philadelphia. There's fear of going outside, there's fear of attending school, and then, and also due to COVID-19, children have been affected with limited resources and positive outlets, especially in and around sports. In addition to that, trash is limiting mobility and safe environments where children and youth can't really play outside. They can't uh, run or exercise and things of that nature because all of this mess that's in the way. And there's also been a lack of education in and around sports with financial literacy, uh, future options, arts and sports, and then even what does life look like after sports. So with all these different limitations and these grand challenges that I identify, I see that there is great trauma for our children and youth. So some of the recommendations um, that I wanna push forward or, or at least advocate and recommend 
um, is year-round funding for child and youth sports-based structured quality programs <laughs> as a preventative service model for sustainability, effectiveness, and accessibility of programs for all children and youth in the city of Philadelphia. So basically making sure that we have greater funding um, for basically out of school time for sports and that it is something that people can allocate um, not every three years, um, but every year, or, and, and also throughout the year they could apply and have access to funding. Providing a safe environment for these young individuals to learn, grow, and have a positive, and have positive guidance through criteria maybe set by the city. <laughs> also making sure that we have safe outlets and facilities for children to work out and, and run and play in instead of being on the streets in the city of Philadelphia, which we know at this point is not the safest. But there have been um, issues with facilities for our children and youth and in having different dialogues and discussion and discussions with uh, coaches here in the city, you know, they've told me that parents have called them and, and let them know that their child can't participate in, in training. Or, or, or games and things of that nature because they don't feel safe with them running outside. Um, also, education wrap sports programs. So making sure that there's some type of holistic um, empowerment going on within these programs, that it's just not to fund sports um, so people can play, but just making sure that there's education in these programs. So what does life after sports look like? Making sure that they're work ready um, through life skills development, financial literacy, reading and writing, and then also that there's some form of trauma-informed care and social-emotional learning within the sports programs. And then lastly, training for coaches, assistants, and program developers for continuity of care. So I, I say all of this because, you know, our children are our future, as cliche as it may be, but, it, but they are. And in order for us to make sure that we have good governance, in order for us to make sure that we have safety moving forward, and, and maybe even opportunities for greater morale um, in our city for for children and youth sports as we do in, in the professional arena and bringing the community together um, in, in unity, right, instead of opposition. So thank you so much uh, for listening to me and I await questions and answers. Thank you for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Will our next panelist please uh, state your name for the record and you may begin with your testimony. Hi, yes, my name is Jasmine Smith. Um, thank you, Councilman Thomas, um, Councilman Jim for inv in the invitation. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Icon Sports. Icon Sports is a nonprofit organization geared towards growing lacrosse and field hockey for children ages 5 through 19 in Philadelphia. Our mission is to empower, educate, and motivate holistically the next generation of field hockey and lacrosse Olympians. It is our belief that through this structure and development of playing field hockey and lacrosse, we will provide our girls and boys with a skill set and development they need in those areas such as sportsmanship, healthy lifestyle, teamwork, self-esteem, history of culture, healthy body image, and academic achievement. This will translate into a wholesome, productive lifestyle, often on the field. Throughout this league, each player goes through a rites of patches curriculum that is specifically designed to prepare them for life, which introducing them to the historic legacies in the African comedic historical aspects, Hispanic history, etiquette, meditation, yoga, self-love, daily meditations, financial literacy, visualizations, academic support, and tutoring. With over 600 players in our four-tier program, which consists of one, creating lacrosse and field hockey in teams at the Philadelphia public and school, public charter schools um, that do not host those sports. Two, travel club teams that offer ages five through 19, where players get the opportunity to travel and play locally, regionally, nationally, internationally for competition. Three, hosting clinics and tournaments in areas of Philadelphia that do not have field hockey and lacrosse to then create sub rec teams. Four, internationally programming in Africa for creating a pipeline for our players to travel to Ghana and Africa, as well as have those players um, come over and so they could participate in tournaments with our players. Uh, one of the things our players have done uh, is create a legal coalition and where they've worked with former Governor Ed Rendell, Councilman uh, Thomas, Councilman Curtis Jones, and a host of other city and state legislators 
to create reforms and policy um, for po policy reforms for police brutality and violence in their own communities. As well, um, we have uh, our our players uh, after once they get into ninth grade, they have the opportunity to work at University of Pennsylvania through a paid internship all four years. Um, and that then allows them to then go on to work for University of Penn if they continue at academic um, career readiness. This past summer, Icons was chosen to be featured and partnered in a multimedia campaign and partnered with Nike. Our players were able to be highlighted and showcase their film, their stories and film um, throughout about Philadelphia, but also their love of playing lacrosse and field hockey. Um, as well, we had over 38 girls participate in a recruiting tournament where they played in Maryland, Virginia, and um, North Carolina to be recruited to play in college through Division I through Division III. Um, during this past latter part of the summer, Einstein, Einstein, Icons partnered with Einstein Hospital for our players to cr create a shadow program for those players that want to continue on um, with their education and then continue with uh, going into the health industry. Um, the violence has affected all of us throughout the city and most of the programs here. Um, it has it really hit us um, a, a lot, especially with uh, reestablishing our Icon Boys program. We have become a safe haven where we now have boys from all over Philadelphia coming to our location at 33rd and Diamond. Um, we have one particular boy that travels from Southwest Philadelphia driving on a bicycle just to attend practice because we're a safe haven where we work with those in the police district to make sure that our players, you know, are not ricocheted with bullets um, and a lot of other violence that has occurred um, throughout the city. Um, we're constantly met with challenges, not only with playing the game, but the biases that happen with receiving permits. Um, we're constantly challenged with uh, the parks and recs with regards to making sure that our girls have the opportunity to use the field at the same time that various other teams do. Um, and it's been constant through the last couple of years, just with the taunting um, with regards to uh, the, the biases uh, that happens, uh, unfortunately, to gender roles. Um, in 2022, we're set to play in the International Olympic World Lacrosse Tournament. This tournament is being hosted in the United States. Um, and this is where teams from all over the world will be playing um, at the highest level of competition. Our players are set to play um, and what we need really is for the city to come behind them. And nationally, internationally, Icons is known, but when it comes to the city of Philadelphia, these girls are not supported, they're not protected in a way that then allows them to continue to break glass ceilings. It will cost over 25,000 to get them to play at this World Lacrosse tournament. And that's the low budget in terms of what we're gonna be able to run, raise money for. So again, I know that others have spoken with regards to you know, the funding that should be accoladed to those sports programs that meet those cr criteria. And so again, that is one of our biggest requests is to really assist these kids, you know, not only just on the field, but academically so that they can soar in areas that they didn't even think that were achievable. Um, and I come to my close. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I want to take a minute to open it up to members of this uh, panel uh, for any questions that they may have for this. I'm sorry, uh, I want to take a minute to open it up to members of this committee for any questions that they have may have for this panel. Um, I'll go first. Um, um, thank you, everybody, again, for your testimony. Uh, just one question for everybody, one separate question. Um, Raheem, I, I first would like you to talk about um, your vision for the summer of 2022. Can you just take maybe um, 30 to 60 seconds to talk about in a dream world, what would you like to see um, as it relates to sports and some of the projects that you're working on to prepare for the summer of 2022? Okay, um, right now, currently, we're working on something called the Chosen Hoops Festival, where we are bringing together all the top high school summer leagues on the East Coast with Philadelphia as the host. And we're still in the planning stages of that. And why it's so important is because it gives Philadelphia the platform to showcase our, our rich basketball history, but it also gives a chance to be able to showcase the good in this city. Because one of the hardest things that I deal with on the regular in dealing with guys from Chicago, which has a violence problem, with D.C. that have a violence problem, is this 500 murders that are just being shown across the country. It makes people scared. 
And it really puts me in a weird spot because I always held the Philadelphia flag up high. So now we got more murders than we got days in the year. So now you're talking about trying to bring people into this city to show the good in the city. But all you see on CNN, you see on all crosses, 500 and some odd murders. That makes it kind of scary for people. And this is why I'm so passionate about it, because, like I said, I I had the people that got murdered and the people that did the murdering. So you Mm -hmm. imagine dealing with those families on a regular basis and trying to stop damn near civil wars breaking out in communities. It is very taxing. I'm tired. And like I said, it's because of you, Councilman Thomas, that I have faith that we will get the support that we need. But in the perfect world, I would love for all all of us to get the funding that we need because what I'm doing, it will help the icons. It will help with Dr. Sharice is doing. It will help with PYB is doing because it's not just basketball. It's showing the good in Philadelphia is what I'm trying to pull together because there's more good than there's negativity in here. It's just the negativity is just having a, a greater impact. And then, and it's what makes it scary. So I I can, I can get long winded because I'm very passionate about this. But I know if y'all really, really, really uh, allocate them dollars to the people that are, are are who are serious about this, we can start making a change in this. Because I never seen the violence like this, and I went through the crack era of the '90s, and it wasn't like this at all. This is this is just very scary. And it's very, like, and Isaiah, you know me, you talk personal all the time. This is very scary for me because I thank God that I've helped enough people during these 20 years because, shit, I could be a victim of a robbery or something like that. And that's just an honest opinion. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Raheem, for your testimony. Um, Jasmine, similar question. Um, thinking about the work you do with icons, the fact that lacrosse is a sport that um, doesn't have uh, the platform and the recognition that it probably deserves. What What are you doing to prepare for the summer of 2022? And what are some of your plans as it relates to how you plan on keeping young people safe in the city of Philadelphia? What What, what services and resources will help you amplify that work? Yeah, well, the biggest thing um, that we're doing is that we're hosting a Juneteenth um, festival um, at 33rd and Diamond. And so we're going to be inviting um, teams, uh, African-American, Latino, teams of color, throughout the whole country to participate um, at this tournament. And that way people will really see that the the number of children participating at this game is growing. Um, As well, we'll be really getting gearing up for the World Lacrosse Tournament. That is the biggest um, uh, highlight uh, for for us this coming year is because we are the only team of color participating at the World Lacrosse Tournament. You'll have teams from Jamaica and various others, but from the United States, we are the only team. And so it's very important that we put a lot of structure um, and, you know, uh, and, and getting them trained to where they can, you know, go out there and they can win the chip. Um, in addition to, we have a couple more schools that we'll be rolling out in 2022, and we want to continue with the 14 schools that we already are programming in to get those numbers. Um, and then that way we're actually um, hiring other coaches. Um, of color to really um, give kids like, you know, the visibility that, you know, it's not just a sport that is not geared towards, you know, us. So, and and for that to happen, the funding has to, you know, we have to have the funding, the right type of funding um, to be able to compete at the level of those uh, other teams that are in different demographics. Thank you. Thane, thank you for your work. I think that uh, when you talk about um, the fact that there's not a whole lot of diversity for you to be uh, putting a lot of young people from the city of Philadelphia in the forefront of that diversity conversation and to be putting young people in a position where I'm sure they're earning scholarships and other um, um, opportunities and moments that they won't forget for the rest of their life. Uh, we appreciate you and we appreciate the work you're doing. So thank you. Um, um, I don't know if Eric is still with us um, from PYB, uh, but what I, I would ask yeah, I'm him. Still here. Okay, same I'm question. Still here. Uh, what are you guys, what, what's the big things that you're doing uh, to prepare for the summer of 2022? And how can the city be more of a service and more of a resource? We listen to a lot of issues around funding and um, access to space. Uh, would you communicate similar issues or would there be something else you would want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, access to space, you know, will definitely be, you know, on the top of the list for uh, for us again this year at PYB. Uh, we had some great success being at Carver and last year and at Grover, Washington. 
but we have the ability, you know, to be able to scale that up a bit. You know, one of the things that was very helpful for us being in those communities, you know, we enjoyed being on the college campuses, but, you know, kind of bringing our program, you know, to the community, having young people, having the ability to walk to some of our locations was very uh, instrumental to our success this past summer. So I think to answer that question, Councilman, you know, kind of really having a clear idea and picture as it pertains to the volume and the the level of access that we will have if we, you know, could get some additional facilities uh, in other sectors of the city to facilitate our summer camp. We would love to be able to do so. And similar to uh, folks experienced last summer, the support and the funding that came from the city to allow us to offer our to a that allowed that allowed us to offer our camp experience at no cost for uh, our participants was was major. Uh, so if we're able to duplicate that again this summer, I think we will be in a great position to serve a tremendous uh, amount of young people in a great way. Thank you, thank you for that. And we want to make sure that we push the district to allow that collaboration to happen with the Office of Children and Families, and also push them to to lax <laughs> some of those requirements to use. Uh, <laughs> school spaces i know for me we um we're working with a number of different partners and it's much easier to get access to a rec center in the city of philadelphia than it was to get into some of the schools based on not just the paperwork requirement but the type of insurance that they were asking for so we do appreciate the district thank you to the office of children and family for your leadership on that issue and we want to push them to do a little more with that as far as access to even more schools because we want to hear more testimonies like what eric is talking about with pyb um as we close out um, um, Doc, if you could just uh, talk to us a little bit, um, and this will be my last question, I promise, about um, some of the work that you uh, have done around impact. Um, I've been pushing this idea of uh, providing more stimulus dollars to, I shouldn't say stimulus dollars, grant dollars to programs like Jasmine's, to programs like Raheem's, to programs like um, uh, PYB. And, 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 and based on everything that we uh, heard today, we see that there's a gap right now as it relates to providing uh, grant dollars to youth-based initiatives. We know we do it a lot with the OST stuff, but similar to what Shana talked about, representing the Freedom School program, they're much more than just OST. Um, so we have this complex problem that we have as it relates to a lot of great people. And we only seen a small sample size of this hearing today. Uh, we have a complex problem um, as it relates to a lot of great people doing a lot of great work, but not necessarily understanding how to access city dollars or how to get city resources or how to use city space or city facilities to be able to uh, continue their great work or scale up the work that they're currently doing. Uh, based on your expert opinion and based on uh, the work that you've done in the past, what recommendations or suggestions would you suggest that we go in as a municipality to rectify some of the issues that were communicated here today? Well, thank you so much for that, Councilman Thomas. Um, I think really what we have to do is we can't just talk, right? We, it's great to deepen the conversation, but there has to be some type of action, some type of result. So I don't know if a tripartite committee needs to happen um, after this uh, council meeting with members of government, um, in finance, and and, and maybe this committee where we're advocating and making sure that by January of 2022, that there is some type of funding available outside of um, OST, right? I think we also have to look at collaborations. Um, you know, I know that Jasmine had mentioned that, you know, her, her, her organization is working with Nike. And, and things of that nature. We have so many different amazing, great professional sports programs here in the city of Philadelphia um, and making sure that, that we help them create greater social impact by helping them um, or, or having them help us to make sure that our children um, have a place to, to or can even go and, and support them in the future, be, so, you know, because we have to make sure that we're giving back to each other, right? And I think that's part of the governmental thing too, is, is making sure that there's some type of accountability for these large complex organizations and sports teams and things like that, um, you know, to, to, to be in the city. Um, so making sure that we have, we have greater conversations with these individuals as well. I think also, um, lastly, is that we have to come together as a community and 
go from all of that deepening the conversation that we did here today and putting some action behind it. So whether that be a community fund um, that's established for these different programs um, or making sure that the government itself uses or it reallocates funding from other programs and making sure that there's something here for, for sports programs in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and then also just making sure that we, we have so many abandoned buildings. We have so many buildings that um, are, are up to code, but you know, they're unoccupied, right? And we maybe need to, to do, I don't know if it's eminent domain or if it's just making sure that we talk to someone, right? And, and we use some of these buildings to facilitate um, some, you know, gyms or, or athletic centers and, and things of that nature, because we can't always keep going to universities. And as crime is going up, universities are locking their doors down um, to the outside community, right? So we have, to, we have to go around and we have to see what else is out there um, and how we can have greater impact. But it takes each and every person in the community to sign this negotiation of a contract, right? But we at least have to put something out there for them to sign. So I think, again, having that tripartite community and just making sure that there's funding consistently available, not just on the three-year term because a lot happens, right? We're in a society of fashion. There's so much changes that happens every single day. Um, we have COVID. Now we have different variants, right? We have, we, we have natural disasters. We have all different types of social problems that happen, but we need to make sure that there is funding for these social problems so we can move forward um, as a community and have a safer environment. Thank you, Doc. I appreciate it. Um, are there any other questions or comments from uh, members of this committee for this particular panel? Hearing none, I want to say thank you to everybody on this panel for your testimony as well as your patience today. Uh, we appreciate your expert opinion as well as the great work you do uh, for children and families across the city of Philadelphia. Um, that concludes the panel testimony for this resolution. Um, we will now begin hearing uh, from individuals who registered to provide public comment. We ask that you please keep your comments to no longer than three minutes. Uh, Mr. Clerk, will you please read the name of the first person registered for public comment? Yes, uh, first we have Noah Latanzi, and I believe he's with Brianna Morales has signed in, great. And I know you all wrote in that you yes, have- a a group of students. Um, if you could just make sure that the students, if they're presenting, you just can state their name for the record. That would be tremendous. Will do. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any of the students here. There was a very chaotic day here at South Philly High School, so a lot of the students left right after school, um, and that was part of the reason why we chose to testify today. So um, Noah's actually with a group of our students now, so they're in another room. Um, but I'm Brianna, I'm the site director for South Philadelphia's OST program at, uh, I mean, Sunrise Philadelphia's OST program at South Philadelphia High School. So Sunrise as a whole, we work with kindergarten through 12th grade, um, primarily in the South Philadelphia area. I'm here at the high school, we work with nine through 12. Um, and we have 75 slots that we, um, at the high school, and we do have a partnership with PYN. So of those 75 slots, we do offer a school year incentive program for those students who are actively um, engaging in our program. So what we wanted to talk about today was how difficult it's been for us to meet some of the numbers that um, we need to every month. We do usually meet them, but it's very challenging between the lack of support from all of the school staff, um, the lack of resources and funding, crime in Philadelphia, transportation costs, and a lot more. Um, our staff have had to go out of their way on multiple occasions to try to engage our students. Um, we've noticed that as crime increased the, and the street lights come on earlier, our, attend our attendance has steadily decreased. Um, and a lot of youth and their families, they have identified the violence of Philadelphia as the main challenge to them consistently attending our program. So being as though we want our students to consistently attend and benefit from what we offer, we've started um, offering programming during the school day, um, during their lunch periods, when they're dismissed early on work release, despite them not having jobs. <laughs> Uh, we offer our space open to them so that we can still engage the students because um, we know that the space is important for them. We do have a lot of our kids who have disclosed that they've been victims of gun violence, one of them actually having been struck by 
um, a bullet this summer and he shares his story with us very comfortably. Um, and he expressed as that him being here is one of the reasons why he's allowed to stay out after school because his family knows that he's here with an OST program. Um, but the biggest challenge we've had is being able to actively like engage the students and um, consistently promote our program. So we noticed that like we need a lot more support from you guys as our city officials, of course, the South Philadelphia um, High School uh, administration and their teachers, the School District of Philadelphia administration. We don't think that OST programs are promoted enough. Um, and because of that, a lot of our students they don't know what we have to offer them. So while we've seen a lot of um, our impact from the students that we do consistently see, we're struggling to meet those numbers um, consistently. And we're struggling to be able to offer all of our potential offerings due to those low enrollment numbers. So as much as we want to, you know, have our gaming club and things like that with us only having five kids allowed to stay after school a week, it, our gaming club just turns into a little fun day for an hour and then our kids all leave out. Um, so we think it's fundamental that we come together as a community, considering we all have similar goals so that we can share resources and promote partnerships that grow and develop, um, community buy-in for OST so that we can continue serving the youth we've been serving and then to continue enroll enrolling more youth, which is our ultimate goal. Um, I know we're running low on time. So in closing, um, I think it will be amazing to see some kind of like citywide initiative or a productive partnership designed to drive OST awareness and enrollment around the amazing programs that we're offering across the city. Um, so even if it's something as simple as like a fair or, you know, mailing out to families a little workbook that kind of explains who all of our providers are, where we are located and things like that. Um, and we'd also love to engage more youth in some meetings like this. So yes, we did want to include some today, but maybe having a meeting where schools from or youth from different schools and OST providers can join us and we can um, include more youth voice in some of these public hearings. So we think it's very important that they have the opportunity to uh, support us in our planning and implementation and OST programming so that we can better serve them and gauge their interests. But thank you all. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to offer testimony today. And if anyone has any questions, um, you guys can ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And most importantly, thank you for the work that you do. We see the you know, chalkboard in the back so we know. It's, it's, it's authentic. Thank you. We appreciate you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, you. Uh, I'm sorry, are there any other are there any questions or comments from members of this committee for this particular witness? Um, hearing that, Mr. Clerk, um, will you please call the next uh, witness to testify here today? Uh, Chair Thomas, that concludes the list of individuals who registered for public testimony. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, there being no further questions from members of the committee and no other witnesses to testify, uh, I will ask that if there is anyone else present in this hearing whose name we have filled the call um, and that wishes to offer testimony on the resolution being considered today. Hearing none, I want to say thank you to all the panels and give a special thank you to Council Member Gim, our chair, as well as uh, her entire staff. Um, Nick, thank you, sir, for being our clerk for today and thank you to the entire team for making this hearing happen. We feel like this is a very important conversation to prepare for uh, the summer of 2022. We know that there's a lot of crime and violence in the city of Philadelphia, and if we want to see those numbers decrease next year, it starts now. Uh, so again, I want to thank everybody um, that is a part of this uh, committee, the panels and the witnesses for their participation today. We value your opinions, and this concludes uh, the public hearing of the council committee today. Uh, we will now recess until uh, the call of the chair. Uh, thank you very much to everybody for your attendance. We appreciate you. Thank, thank you, you folks. Have Thomas. a good one.